Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. I hope that you can all see and hear me. Um, and uh, we're going to carry on with our discussion about bacterial growth. And um, to start off with this morning, what I'm going to be talking about is mostly how we actually culture bacteria in the laboratory, how we, in, how, how we make use of features of bacterial growth in order to, to grow them in the lab. Um, and then we'll move on actually to some characteristics of the way in which bacteria grow. So the first, uh, let me explain to you um, that all laboratories where uh, biological work is done, whether it's teaching labs or research labs, are rated. And they are rated according to, <clears throat> to the risk imposed by the work and by the, the presence of uh, potentially dangerous, potentially pathogenic microorganisms in the lab. So for example, in your, um, uh, in a biology lab, um, a biology lab is uh, biosafety level one, BSL one. And that means it's an ordinary lab does not deal with, uh, with usually with living organisms which are capable of infection or of causing uh, disease of any sort. So that's BSL-1. This is the sort of thing you'll be, you go work in the lab. You'll, if you see living things, there'll be amoebas, those sorts of things which aren't going to pose any risk. BSL-2 um, is a lab that's similar to the one in which you currently do your microbiology laboratories. That is, um, you are dealing with uh, organisms some of which are potentially pathogenic, but you're also doing work which could give rise to pathogens. By that, I mean, if you, for example, uh, if you're culturing a specific bacterium, you're culturing something harmless like pseudomonas or something on an, on an agar plate, there is a risk that contaminants can come in and grow and that those contaminants could actually be pathogenic. So there are certain uh, there's a certain level of precaution which needs to be observed. And the strict precaution in a BSL-2 lab is ab absolutely no eating, no drinking in the lab, because that is a way of introducing that potential pathogens into your mouth, into your gut. The second thing is that uh, we usually um, ask for that people wear gloves um, and it, um, in particular, if not th that, that they observe strict hand washing before, during, and after the lab. Um, in addition, the, in a BSL-2 lab, you may be asked to wear eye protection as an initial layer of caution, but these are the, the risks are regarded as being fairly minimal and easily avoided by ordinary pra hygiene practices and ordinary common sense as well, and observing lab safety procedures. A BSL-3 lab uh, deals with known pathogens, and um, in particular pathogens where there is a risk of airborne uh, transmission. And so in BSL-3 labs, all work is done, all work with living organisms, is done in biosafety cabinets. And um, those are negative pressure cabinets. They suck air in and exhaust it through HEPA filters. So the flow is always through the, the chamber. And um, there's minimal risk of uh, organisms leaving the chamber and infecting people. There are other training procedures that one needs to undergo in order to, to work under these conditions. A BSL-4, biosafety level 4 lab, is one of the highest priority labs, the highest security labs, which deal with pathogens with very high infectivity, the very high level of likelihood that they will cause illness. And um, that would be working with things like Ebola, those sorts of diseases. And there the entire facility um, is usually completely sealed off, kept under negative pressure. And very often the uh, personnel have to shower, to go, go in, shower to come out, dress in full protective gear, et cetera, et cetera. Very, very high levels of 
security are observed in those, in those labs. And all of the air which leaves the lab is very, very carefully filtered so that uh, no pathogens are admitted into the, into the outside air. And usually, um, and, and, unless under very, very special circumstances, uh, nothing really leaves the lab. Usually people, uh, um, nothing which has been exposed inside the lab leaves the lab. Full protective gear and everything is taken off, um, packed and autoclaved so that people do not carry stuff, run any risk, minimal though it is, of, of taking stuff outside the lab. Okay, so uh, that said, remembering that we work in a BSL-2 level lab, um, let's uh, have a, a discussion about uh, some of the issues surrounding the culturing of bacteria. Now, you have already in lab, I'm sure, been busy culturing, but maybe there are some things that you need to know about terminology and uh, techniques that you are using. Now, first of all, You'll hear this term the whole time, the medium, the medium, the medium, um, and culture medium, culture medium, culture medium. So all that that means is the preparation of nutrients suitable for bacterial growth. That's all. That may be, the culture medium may be solid medium, as in agar, um, or it may be liquid medium, as in a nutrient broth. And basically, quite honestly, an the solid media are simply liquid media which have been solidified for ease of use. And why those are easier to use, I'll point out in a minute. When we say that something is sterile, what we mean is there are no, there are no living microbes in it. The medium has been sterilized. There are various ways to sterilize media. The commonest way is to autoclave it. And um, that is to... Uh, raise the temperature under pressure so that even bacterial spores are killed if they were present. Or, and so the, the, the medium emerges from the autoclave completely sterile. There are other ways to sterilize. You can also sterilize media by passing them through a very fine filter. And what that does is it actually traps, or traps bacteria and spores on a filter so that the filtrate is completely sterile. That is used when we're dealing with a fragile medium, a medium which would be altered by heating in an autoclave. The inoculum is are those bacteria that you deliberately introduce into the medium. He was told, inoculate the medium. What you inoculate with is an inoculum. You take a sample of bacteria and you inoculate the media. One thing in your lab, I'm not teaching lab, but the one thing I will repeat, I'm sure you've heard it a hundred times, never inoculate with too much, rather inoculate with very little and than too much. Um, remembering that a visible colony, a colony just vis visible to the naked eye on an agar plate contains about a billion cells. So a very, very small, inoculum contains an enormous amount, uh, an enormous number of bacteria. The, once you've inoculated, what you're looking at is a culture. And you hopefully the culture grows. And then it's the, the microbes growing in or on a culture medium. And that is your culture. And you establish culture under, special, under particular conditions usually. Okay, which we will discuss in a minute. So the media that you deal with um, the, uh, in, in lab depends very much on what you are trying to do and what kind of bacteria you're trying to grow. So for, for example, we can establish a medium where we know the concentration of every single component exactly. We know the molar concentration of every single component. And that is known as a chemically defined medium. It is usually used for uh, growing bacteria which are fastidious. That is that they need a particular medium on which to grow. 
and the very often we will take a, we will establish such a chemical medium and add we can add to it anything particular that a particular organism would need to grow for example if it needs an essential vitamin we might add that again in exactly the concentration that we know so there these uh, chemically defined media are often used for bacteria which require a very uh, particular growing environment. Most of the bacteria that you will deal with, in fact, all the bacteria you deal with, are not are permissive. They are not fastidious. They don't require rigid conditions in which to grow. They are permissive. They grow under a wide variety of conditions, as long as they've got enough of everything. And um, those we can grow on what we refer to as complex media. And these are usually made of uh, di enzymatic digests of proteins, um, where the proteins can be extracted from yeast, from meat, from plants, all sorts of things. Uh, for example, uh, yeast extract is commonly used. Peptone, tryptone that you will hear about, those are meat extracts that have been digested, enzymatically digested by pepsin or by trypsin. Um, and there are also soy derived uh, amino acids and things which, which can be used. And here, the, we don't know the exact chemical composition. We know that we put in these, these, these things, we put in yeast extract, we put in peptone, um, uh, but we can't say how much cysteine is present. We can't say how much uh, tryptophan is present. We just know that there's a lot of it. We know how much yeast extract we put in. We know how much peptone we put in. But honestly, uh, from one batch to another of pep peptone, or, I mean, one batch to another of yeast extract, there might be variability, but it doesn't matter. There's plenty enough for the bacteria to grow, and that's all that matters. So a, a new, good nutrient broth, for example, is really simple. All it consists of is yeast extract, um, a rich source of amino acids, which are peptone and tryptone, and water, and that's it. In the case of some specialized bacteria, like marine bacteria, we might have to add salt or something like that. But uh, the yeast extract has two functions. First of all, it does provide amino acids as well. But yeast extract also contains many vitamins of different, uh, the different kinds, which are very useful to bacteria growing in the medium. The tryptone and peptone are put in as a major amino acid source. And uh, that's all that there is to it. Um, the, uh, a nutrient agar is simply a nutrient broth like this, to which we've added agar to solidify it. And agar is a, a substance, it's a polysaccharide, which is extracted from seaweed. And it's used as the solidification agent for culture media um, of various kinds. We can make agar, we can make an agar preparation on a plate. That's the commonest way you will see it. Um, or we can make it in, in tubes, which are incubated at a slant. And so they've got a big surface area on the top. Those are called slants or in tubes which are, in, which are cooled when they are upright like that, so that there's a, a deep layer of egg. Uh, these slants and deeps are often used for storing bacteria, not for a very, very long time, but you can store bacteria on slants and deeps um, for a period of months, as long as they kept refrigerated. So the agar, uh, the great advantage of agar is uh, that it's, there's not a lot of bacteria which will digest it, this, unless you're working in marine systems. In marine systems, it's a big problem, can be a big problem. But for most of the bacteria that we work with in the lab, pathogens, human pathogens, or environmental bacteria, terrestrial bacteria, very few of them that digest ever. In the old days, when in the golden age of microbiology, when they started trying to solidify plates, they solidified with gelatin, which is an extract from connective tissue 
of animals. It works very well to solidify, and that's jello. Um, but the problem is many, many bacteria can digest gelatin very easily, and they love to do it. It's a very good nutrient in actual fact. And so the, the plates just turned to mush until they started using agar to solidify. Now, agar has other advantages as well. Agar, if you make a solution of agar, um, you need to boil it in order to get the agar to liquefy and get dispersed through the medium. So at 100 degrees Celsius, you boil it and it disperses through the medium. You then take your liquid medium and you can cool it. And you can cool it all the way down to about 45 40 to 45 degrees Celsius. It varies a little bit depending on the quality of the agar. 40 to 45 degrees Celsius is where the agar begins to set. And that's very useful because most bacteria will survive 40 to 45 degrees Celsius. Um, you wouldn't want to keep them there for a long, long time, but for a short time, they, they're perfectly happy. That is very useful for the reason that you'll see in a while. We can use agar, we can disperse bacteria in agar and then pour them on a plate if we need to for purposes that we'll see in a while. So those are important characteristics of, of agar. So here is a chemically defined medium. And in this case, they're growing, this is for growing uh, Escherichia coli, E. coli not a fastidious organism at all, but maybe somebody is looking to see what growth factors does E. coli need in order to grow properly. Okay, that would be one set of experiments. So they would make this basic defined medium. It's got glucose, exactly five grams. We know exactly what our glucose is made, so we know exactly what it's contributing. Ammonium phosphate, sodium chloride, and magnesium sulfate, potassium phosphate, and then water. Very carefully measured, and very carefully dissolved. So let's just have a look through here and see what this medium is contributing. For the, first of all, here's the glucose. What is the glucose there for? The glucose is a carbon source and it's an energy source as well. Right? Just, it's a fuel, just the same as anything else, any other fuel. It can serve as a carbon source, but especially as an energy source to the bacteria. Ammonium phosphate, well, there's two things in ammonium phosphate that, that are important. The first is this, it provides a lot of nitrogen. It's a major nitrogen source for proteins, um, uh, nucleotides, all of those sorts of things. But it also provides phosphate, which is particularly important in construction of nucleic acids, but functions in ATP, all of those other things. Sodium chloride is there to establish an isotonic environment, a very favorable growing environment for, for the bacteria. Magnesium sulfate, magnesium itself there is an important trace element, but the sulfate there is also important. The, the, cells need sulfur. Potassium phosphate provides um, abundant, uh, abundant potassium and abundant phosphorus as well. So those are all the basic things, but what you may find is even if you take your E. coli and you try to grow it in this, it won't grow because it's missing essential things. And this is maybe what, what is the most interesting thing would be to take a basic chemically defined medium and now add to it, for example, a range of vitamins one by one to see which uh, vitamins, for example, are essential to E. coli. Which vitamins can it not make? From this, believe it or not, E. coli can make most of what it needs, but it may need one or two additional things which got to come in entire already created, and those we call the essentials. Essential vitamins, essential fatty acids, for example, that the cell cannot make itself. That's the kind of thing you would use a defined medium to do. 
here's the medium that we would normally grow E. coli on, and many, many other things as well. Um, and these are peptone. Peptone is meat, basically, that has been digested with pepsin. Pepsin is the protease, the protein digesting enzyme, which is produced in the stomach. So the peptone is meat protein that has been digested to either single amino acids or to short polypeptides, which the bacteria can easily use um, by incubating it with this enzyme. You may also see uh, sometimes that media contain tryptone. Tryptone is the same thing. It's meat protein, but it has been digested by trypsin, which is a pancreatic protease. It does the same thing. Beef extract, again, you know, beef extract is also a source of amino acids, uh, but beef extract also contains a lot of vitamins and various other things that are useful to bacteria. Sodium chloride, again, it's often added simply, uh, mainly uh, to keep uh, the osmolarity of the medium uh, suitable. Agar, there it is. This is a standard addition of agar, 15 grams per liter. Provides you with a good solid um, medium when it cools. And then water, a liter. Very, very simple. But this complex is a complex medium because we can't say how many, exactly how many of each amino acid we have, right? We've got as many sources. We can't say exactly how much of the vitamins that we've got, et cetera, et cetera. But we just know we've got lots. We've got plenty. And um, that, that's all that our bacteria want to know as well. Now, there are some many specialized media. There were one or two that you might encounter um, in, in lab. And the first one uh, of importance um, is called a reducing medium. So a reducing medium, what it does is it takes all the oxygen, uh, any oxygen that is in the medium, and it reduces it. It adds hydrogens to it. And what is it making? It's making water, H2O. That's the fundamental principle. A reducing medium takes all the oxygen and it actually, it actually removes it from the, from the medium. So there's no free oxygen anymore. And uh, this, uh, these uh, substances, the most common one is sodium thioglycolate. Just in the same way as I just described, I said, if we want to reduce oxygen, we take we can take hydrogen added, make water, that's reducing the oxygen. But sodium thioglycolate does a similar thing. It grabs onto the oxygen and it actually reduces it by binding to it and uh, removes it from being dissolved. Usually with um, these reducing media, what we do before we use them, we usually heat them up for a while and then cool, cool them again. And that drives off in the small amount of free oxygen that is present, it will drive it off. Now, I'm not sure because I'm not running the lab, but um, uh, you may see sodium thioglycolate medium. And um, very often we combine sodium thioglycolate medium with an indicator. It's a substance called resazurin. And resazurin turns pink when it, there is oxygen present. So you can actually look at your thioglycolate tube and you can see, what you usually see is right at the very top, you see a little band of pink. And the rest of the, the tube is usually clear. And that indicates to you that the thioglycolate has worked. It's taken up all of the free oxygen. So there's no free oxygen available. The a thioglycolate will keep much of the tube, not all of it, the very surface may be oxygenated. But the rest of the tube will be anaerobic. So but there are also other ways in which we can establish an anaerobic environment. Um, this is a simple anaerobe chamber. And um, you will see something similar in lab. This is an anaerobe chamber or an anaerobe jar. And um, what, we, what is happening here, this is a, a, a jar into which we put our place that we want to turn anaerobic. 
uh, we seal it very carefully. It has to be it has to be very, very carefully sealed. Even a few molecules of oxygen present in, in the jar can stop an obligate anaerobe from growing. And uh, we then put in usually um, a set of chemicals. This comes in an envelope that you open. And what, what happens is that uh, the, the uh, substances inside here catalyze a reaction in which they bind all of the oxygen into largely into carbon dioxide, sometimes into a mixture of carbon dioxide and water. Um, but they also often release hydrogen so that they use up all of the oxygen inside here and then render it completely anaerobic. Um, and you, you usually put in an indicator, methylene blue, which turns blue in the presence of oxygen. So that you can check, you can see if as long as your indicator is white, clear, you know it's anaerobic. Um, some obligate anaerobes are extremely, extremely fastidious about oxygen. They cannot have oxygen anywhere near them. Even a molecule or two will kill them. And um, working with these kinds of anaerobes is extremely difficult. So uh, what is done is you usually work in an anaerobe chamber like this. And uh, the anaerobe chamber has two levels to it. You put in your, the things that you're going to use, like your um, media and everything, are put into an airlock here, um, which is evacuated and is replaced with an, an, uh, an inert gas of some sort, often hydrogen or whatever. Um, they may be left. It depends on the media, but sometimes they will be left here and that will be cleared and then refilled to ensure that they're, they're completely clear of oxygen. And they're then introduced into the central chamber where all of the work is done. It's kept completely sealed because you work through uh, sleeves. You have to put your hands in and then reach inside to do all, all your work. So the media inside here and the bacteria inside here never see any oxygen at all. Now there's one other group of organisms that you should hear about. And these are a group called the capnophiles. Capnophiles can be important pathogens. And um, when we hear about the conditions that they live under, you'll realize, you'll realize why. These are organisms which need a high concentration of carbon dioxide in their environment and um, a low concentration, but not an absence, a low concentration of uh, oxygen. So they're actually micro aerophiles that require high CO2. Well, that is the sort of condition that we might expect in many of our tissues, a high carbon dioxide concentration and low oxygen concentrations. Remember that oxygen is transported around our, our bodies bound. It is bound to come to hemoglobin and is exchanged directly to cells. So our body fluids often are very low in oxygen. Um, and tissues may, may, interstitial fluids may in fact be anaerobic. And that is how anaerobic organisms grow inside us. Um, we, our body fluids are not necessarily full of oxygen. It's our cells that require the oxygen and it's transmitted directly from the red blood cells to the cells. So capnophilic organisms um, are, in just, are adapted to conditions which are present in many of our tissues. And um, it, in order to grow them, uh, we well, there's two ways in which we can do it. The commonest, the old fashioned way, and the simplest way, you can still do it if you're in the field or whatever, um, is to set up what's called a candle jar. So you have here are all your cultures that you've, you've inoculated, and you're trying to grow, um, and you put a lighter candle in the jar and you close it. And the candle will use up most of the oxygen. It will produce abundant carbon dioxide. And that is an ideal situation. That's ideal for the capnophiles. If not, you can also just buy a, a little envelope of chemicals 
and put it into a jar and that'll do the same thing. The most famous uh, group of capnophiles are the Nyaserias. And Nias, you'll recognize them when I tell you. Uh, Nyaseria gonorrhea is the organism that causes the disease gonorrhea. Um, but there is another one, uh, in fact, probably equally, and if not more important, which is not sexually transmitted, which is Nyaseria meningitides which causes a very serious bacterial meningitis. So those would be grown as capnophiles. So let's um, think a little bit about the different media, other kinds of qualities of media. And um, the, the, those and ordinary nutrient media are things on which most things will grow and um, you grow organisms on them. Um, they, when organisms grow on ordinary nutrient agar, agar medium, they may grow with uh, particular characteristics, colors, shapes, etc., to the colonies, which enable you to distinguish one from the other. Okay. Um, but they will pr pretty much grow anything. Uh, they don't just, they, they don't make any distinction between what grows on them and what doesn't to f to a large extent it's not entirely true but um, there may be circumstances under which we want to only grow organisms from of a particular kind or from a particular group and when we when that is the case we will try to grow those bacteria on media which select for them. The selective media prevent the growth of organisms that we are not interested in and encourage the growth of organisms that we are particularly interested in. So what is usually the case is that it's a medium that contains some sort of inhibitor to which our bacteria of interest are resistant. So they select, the medium itself selects what grows on it. The other kind of, of property of media is that they may also they may be differential. And the difference is that a differential medium allows different things to grow, but they grow with different characteristics so that we can easily recognize them. And we can e recognize them by specific properties, specific biochemical properties, especially. So they allow us to distinguish colonies of different microbes very easily. And at the same time, they tell us something about the way in which those bacteria are functioning. Many media have both selective and differential characteristics. Um, so, uh, for example, here is a, a different, an easy differential medium to understand. Uh, this is blood agar, which you will see in lab. Um, a blood agar is made. It's very carefully made uh, nutrient medium. It's a very rich medium, so it grows most things. Very good for growing human associated organisms. And it contains red blood corpuscles. This is important. The red blood corpuscles in the medium are entire. And the medium is specially carefully made, so that the red blood corpuscles, it's sheep's blood usually, the red blood corpuscles do not burst. They stay entire can contain, and contain their hemoglobin still. So you grow them on and have a look here and you'll see here's the bacterial colony right in the center here. These are single colonies here. And surrounding them there, you can see there is a halo. Um, that halo is what makes blood agar differential because those halos, the halo can have different characteristics. And here they are here. They're if the characteristics are alpha, beta, and gamma. So alpha, let me do beta first, because it's the easiest one to understand. This is beta. This, is, this process here of clearing is called hemolysis. It's destruction of blood. So this is beta hemolysis. And what happens in beta hemolysis is the enzymes released by the bacteria burst the red blood corpuscles and, the, the, and they break down the hemoglobin into components which the bacteria can absorb. 
And as a result, the plate clears completely and it loses color entirely and uh, it becomes clear. That is beta hemolysis. This is also hemolysis. It's a little bit more difficult to make out, but this is alpha hemolysis. And you see here, what has happened is they do not clear the plate. They don't break the, the they don't burst the, the, the red blood corpuscles and use up all the hemoglobin entirely. Instead, they partially break down the hemoglobin and it produces this green pigment. So this greenish stain is alpha. The third one, gamma, is nothing. Gamma hemolysis, they're not hemolyzing. That, that's all that there is to it. Okay, so it's alpha, beta, and gamma. This is important though, because it shows that they grow quite happily. They're growing, quite, these bacteria here are growing quite happily, but they don't, uh, they don't uh, lice the, the, the cells at all. Uh, by the way, I'll point out, these are different bacteria, okay? This, is, this bacteria is different to this one, it's different to this one, different kinds of bacteria. So here is another um, differential medium. Um, and this is one uh, which you are going to see uh, in lab. Uh, this is mannitol salts agar. And um, uh, in fact, mannitol salts agar is both differential and selective. And let me, to, I just want to flip ahead. I just want to see, no, there isn't. Okay, it is differential and selective. So I'll just uh, describe to you first how um, it is actually uh, differential. Uh, mannitol salts agar uh, incorporates a dye. Um, it's an indicator, a pH indicator, and the pH indicator will change from pink to red to yellow under acid conditions. So it's a very good indicator of, of a fermentation taking place, of the production of acid products from fermentation. So it distinguishes between organisms which ferment and those that don't. So the, so the sugar that is present in this agar is the sugar mannitol. And only certain bacteria are actually able to ferment it. This, and this is a good discriminatory test between different species of Staphylococcus. So here is Staphylococcus aureus. This is Staphylococcus epidermidis. Epidermidis does not ferment mannitol. Aureus does. So here's the yellow stain around it here. And um, there's no yellow stain around Staphylococcus. They both grow perfectly well um, on the agar. Um, it's in this picture here, mannitol salts agar is not being used as a selective medium. They are just growing Staphylococcus. But mannitol salts agar has a very high concentration of salt in it. And that makes it selective makes it strongly selective. Strongly selective for halophiles, for organisms which are adapted to a high salt concentration. Look at these two, Staphylococcus epidermidis, the Staphylococcus aureus. Where do you think these might grow? They grow on the skin. They grow in a salt-rich environment of the skin. And a high, they do not mind a high salt concentration. If I tried to grow E. coli on here, the E. coli would not grow. It would be unable to grow. And in that case, I could be using the mannitol salts agar as a selective medium. I, I, use, I can use mannitol salts as to select halophiles. So, but in this picture here, it's, being, it's shown, displaying its differential nature. So here's another one which you will also encounter in, uh, in lab, which is both selective and differential. And um, this is uh, McConkie's agar. And um, McConkie's agar is um, a very old fashioned agar, still widely, widely used. And uh, McConkie's uh, contains bile salts. And uh, those, where would you encounter bile salts? in the gut. Bile is a liver product which is released into the gut to help us digest fat. 
and it emulsifies fats in the gut. So gut bacteria are exposed to a constant source of bile. Bile is actually quite strongly um, uh, bactericidal. It kills bacteria, but the gut bacteria are adapted to its presence, so they aren't affected by it. So bile salts are a very good selective element to include in a medium if you want to grow gut bacteria. That's the first thing. Um, so here, here we're going to, here's the uh, McConkie's with its bile salts in it. It has some other things which are, are selective and uh, differential as well, but bile salts is the thing which selects for gut bacteria. And um, here, what they've done is they have inoculated here with E. coli, common gut bacteria. And here they've incubated, they have inoculated with Staphylococcus. It's not a gut bacteria. And it selects against Staphylococcus. In fact, bile salts are strongly selected against all gram positives. Um, it favors the growth of gram negatives. So that's the first thing. But uh, McConkie's also contains um, uh, crystal violet, which, uh, will which is a good uh, uh, um, selective medium as well. And then it also contains a pH indicator. And um, here the pH indicator is acting to display again the production of, uh, of a um, acid from glucose. So here's a, this is E. coli here, and um, the here it's it is growing. This here, in actual fact, is Salmonella, and uh, Salmonella. It in, in this case here, it, in actual fact, it is not reacting. It is not fermenting, but the E. coli is fermenting strongly, and that's what gives it this deep color. So in this case here, we are, we are distinguishing between E. coli and Salmonella and their ability to ferment. So in this case here, it's selected against a gram positive. In this case here, it's selecting, it's differentiating between two gram negatives. Here's a gram negative E. coli and a gram negative Salmonella. Okay, so this, uh, now, I'm just going to discuss a little bit about our use of these uh, media. First of all, let's just think about uh, nutrient media. If you're looking at a nutrient medium, a liquid uh, that you inoculate with bacteria, you can very easily tell with a liquid medium whether or not your bacteria have grown because the medium will go turbid. It will become cloudy as more and more and more bacteria grow. But there's it's very, very difficult to look at that and know whether that is actually all the bacterium you inoculated with. What if that liquid medium got contaminated with something else, right? What if you mixed up and you put in two? You wouldn't be able to tell, right? You wouldn't, this, it doesn't show you very much characteristic growth. It just grows turbid. Instead, if we want to establish a pure line of bacteria, if we want to know that we are always selecting the same bacterium and we're maintaining it in a pure culture, what we have to do is make use of our solid media. And this is the way in which it's done. You've probably learned this already. This is a typical streak. So what is happening is you, here's our solid medium. You take a small, and the key is you take a small inoculum and you streak it like this. And I want you to think about what is happening as you actually do physically do that streak. You, as you do it, you start off here and you move along in your streak like this. As the streak progresses, you are taking less and less and you're smearing out less and less and less bacteria. In other words, just this one streak here 
is a way of diluting. You streak and at the start there's lots and as you proceed there's fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer and you streak. Now you come along here and what you're going to do is you're going to just all that you're doing is you're sampling that little area there on your next sample, right? So you come here and you only sampling that little area. And now you're streaking out again, fewer and fewer and fewer. Same thing here. Here's your next, you're only sampling that area there, doing a streak again, less and less and less. And now you come here with your final streak and at the end here, you've got the least number of bacteria of the whole procedure. What you're doing as you're doing this streak, you're doing a dilution series. You're taking fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer bacteria, and you're spreading them further and further apart. The hope is that towards the end of the streaking procedure, you will spread your few bacteria far enough away from one another that you'll end up with single bacteria. One, 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 one. It's widely separated on the plate. And you didn't let, then leave them to grow. And they will grow into colonies with billions upon billions of cells. But the colony will be discrete. And the colony will consist of a pure uh, collection of bacteria which have arisen from one cell. That is your pure culture. These colonies represent clones and they are hopefully clones of the bacterium that you wanted to grow. And they are pure cultures. They are pure clones of that bacterium. You very quickly, when you do this, you very quickly learn to recognize the characteristics of these colonies. They acquire a look in, in your, you can recognize. You can look at colonies and say, yes, that is the, that is the same colony form that I have seen when I know that I was looking at a pure culture. So this is a very useful way. It gives you, not only does it allow you to develop a pure culture like this from individual bacteria, but it also produces colonies with recognizable characteristic. To, to them. So let's have a look um, at the actual growth uh, mechanisms of bacteria and to begin to understand how it is that those single colonies, those single bacteria ended up producing these. So this is how bacteria reproduce. Bacteria grow, they, re they, they um, only reproduce by binary fission. So they grow to a certain size and there are cellular cues when they reach a certain size, which cue them to reproduce their entire genome. So they produce, reproduce two chromosomes. By the way, they also reproduce whatever plasmids they have at the same time. Those um, two chromosomes become separated from one another, largely by growth, by attachment to protein inside the cell, and then by growth of the cell, it actually physically pulls them apart. Then once it reaches, they are well separated and it's reached, the cell has reached the requisite size, um, a septum develops here between the two and a cross wall is formed between the two cells. Now you see they are actually slightly smaller than the original mother cell. So each of these are identical. They contain exactly the same genetic information. They are clones of one another. They then proceed to reproduce and they, they grow until the requisite size and they reproduce. This process can take place extremely rapidly. Um, this uh, in, for E. coli under ideal conditions, good medium, 37 degrees Celsius, uh, this can take place within 20 minutes, um, the growth and then entire reproduction, replication of the DNA and the, everything else. So uh, here's a, a picture. This is, um, here's the, the, the plasma membranes of each new cell there. And then the cell wall 
z the cell walls being formed need to be formed between these two here. And once that has happened, they will, the cells can separate. They do not necessarily separate. They may continue to be bound together, especially by capsular material, um, et cetera, the, ex, the stuff that is exterior to the cell wall. And this is another characteristic of the bacteria. When we look at them um, through the microscope, we may see that on division like this, uh, they may stay together in chains um, or they may form clusters of one sort or another. Um, but, and that is a ca another characteristic of the bacteria, which is de genetically determined. So, um, uh, as I say, it can take place very, very rapidly, 20 minutes for many bacteria. But um, other bacteria reproduce much more slowly, and they also reproduce much more slowly as conditions become unfavorable. So every, di every division like this we refer to as a generation. And the, the total number of cells that we observe is two to the power of the number of generations. And so, for example, um, the, if we take two cells, right, and we allow them, that's generation one, we allow them to divide generation two, two to two, four cells. So it's as simple as that. So when we just start plotting this out, we realize that the growth curves actually are logarithmic. Um, and just here, for example, our first generation to the zero, second generation, two cells. Uh, this is when we start with one. Okay. The, uh, uh, the second generation, four, um, third generation, eight, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this means that the growth overall of the population cell is extremely rapid. Exponential growth is, occurs extremely rapidly. But you need to understand something, and that is that this very, very rapid growth in an environment where there's not a constant input of nutrients is very soon going to start using up the, all of the nutrients. And it's going to start creating conditions which are adverse for growth. So that is going to start putting some constraint upon the, upon the growth of the bacteria. So use, uh, go through this please, and just uh, realize that within a very, very short time, look, within 20 generations of uh, the start of growth under ideal conditions, we produce more than a million cells. And this can, this can take place, of course, within a matter of hours. This is of enormous significance, especially in terms of health practices and everything else. Contamination by bacteria can be an extremely serious matter for this exact reason. Because in actual fact, the, uh, the growth is so rapid and they produce such huge populations within a very short time. So, here, uh, easier to understand is to actually look at a graph of, the, uh, of this. So uh, this is uh, now purely the number. So this is arithmetic here, okay, the scale here. So uh, there's a couple of things to say about, uh, first of all, uh, see that there's a lengthy period where it appears that very little is happening. And um, that is for some interesting reasons. Um, uh, initially, uh, it was thought that it was simply because, you know, there were just too few for us to observe and et cetera, et cetera. It now transpires that, in fact, this is a very interesting period of growth. Because think back to what I told you about quorum sensing. Bacteria, in fact, cue one another. As they grow under favorable conditions, they release compounds which can be picked up by other bacteria. And as bacteria, other bacteria sense those compounds, they in fact increase their metabolism rates. They begin to grow more rapidly and they approach division status more rapidly. 
So this is a way for an entire bacterial population to respond to suitable conditions and called quorum sensing. When there is a requisite number of bacteria that are growing quite happily, then the whole population begins to grow. So this is one of the ex explanations for this very slow growth at the start. And this we call the lag phase, the, the very beginning. In any case, we're just ignoring that, realize that these are, um, these are generation time, these are the number of generations, okay? If you want to go back, you can look here and have a look and see the actual numbers. When we plot it arithmetically, it comes into this U-shaped curve here, like that. And that is the typical exponential curve. Um, it becomes extremely difficult to plot, however, and to use. So we usually plot logarithmically. We plot the log to base 10 of the numbers. So uh, the, if you go and look up the, the log of the numbers, this is how what they turn out to be, 1.53, 4.52, 6.02. And characteristically, what we end up with in logarithmic growth is a straight line there. This logarithmic growth is actually characteristic of a particular growth phase for the bacteria, as we'll see in a minute. It is preceded by a, growth, a period of very, very slow growth when the bacteria are unable to talk to one another, when the quorum is not being reached. Once the quorum is reached, they begin doubling at a really relatively constant rate. In other words, their doubling time stays the same. And every generation, they double their numbers. So if it's 20 minutes, every 20 minutes, they double the numbers, double the numbers, double the numbers, producing arithmetically this curve here, logarithmically, a straight line. So, uh, when we look at the growth of bacteria within a contained situation, you have set up a culture vessel and you have inoculated. Now we're going to watch the growth of the bacteria in that culture vessel. This is the way it proceeds. Here is a lengthy period of time where very growth is extremely slow. This is the period that I told you about where the quorum has not been reached. And the bacteria, their, their growth is slow. They are even though the conditions are rich, they are responding slowly because they're not re receiving the correct, they're not receiving uh, favorable input from their community, in other words. So there is a lot of metabolic activity. They are pulling in nutrients, they are preparing for growth, et cetera, et cetera, and they're producing signaling molecules. They may be producing signaling molecules, but growth is very slow. There's very little increase in the population. And this we refer to as the lag phase. This changes very rapidly. Once, the, once that quorum is reached, they switch over into the log phase. And now look, this, by the way, this axis here is the log axis. So here you see it's more or less a straight line. This is the logarithmic or exponential growth. This is um, the most vigorous period of growth. At the end of logarithmic growth, two things begin to happen. The first is that they, they, they begin to exhaust available nutrient or nutrient available within their immediate environment. So growth begins to slow. In addition, they, begin, they are releasing, while they're growing, I mean, they're releasing waste products, they're expelling waste products, which also accumulate in the environment and themselves be, begin to slow growth. They now, the population now enters this period here called stationary phase. And this is a period of equilibrium. As many uh, cells are going to start dying now, but as many cells are produced, die. So the population stays the same. So there's a balance between cell death and cell reproduction. But that itself reaches an end. There's a point to which the environment actually begins to be unfavorable. It may be toxic because of waste products, but also there's no, there's inadequate nutrients. 
And it may just be one nutrient. It may be just be one nutrient that is they all need that they've used up. And as a result, cell death be begins to exceed cell growth, cell reproduction. And we enter a death phase, which is itself logarithmic, but now it's a negative. It, they begin to die at a logarithmic rate. So th the death can be extremely rapid. It should be mentioned, however, that some of them, very often there are some cells which are able to survive all the way down and um, they may shut down their metabolism. Um, they, may, they may be other strategies whereby they slow their metabolism so that they are not subject to the rigors of their environment. And these we call persister cells. Now this is, depends on the bacteria uh, as to whether they can produce these or not. There's another really important thing that starts to happen. In this stationary phase here, the cells actually register that the conditions are becoming unfavorable. And it is here in this stationary phase, for example, that you might expect that those two genera, Bacillus and Clostridium, the two gram positive types of bacteria will begin to produce spores because spores are completely used they're not metabolically active. So they escape this whole, uh, this whole death phase. The spores are not metabolically active. They're not actually really, they're alive, but they're not the participant in this whole scenario because they're not taking in, they don't need to take in nutrients. They don't need to expel waste. It is of no consequence to them. But vegetative cells, um, into this death phase here. So uh, just um, also realize, uh, just have a look at this and um, just think about, uh, just read through this here um, uh, and realize how really important it is in disease processes, for example, to understand this growth phase, this growth pattern here. Because um, you'll realize why it is so important, why uh, infection, for example, is so dangerous. Because you can start with very, very few bacteria. And within a short time, they produce a very, very high population. Should also say that all the way through this log phase is when the cells are at their most healthy, is when they are producing the most enzymes, exoenzymes, releasing enzymes into the environment, for example, to digest the food around them. Those enzymes and things that they are releasing may themselves be toxic or pathogenic. And so this is disease processes. This log phase is extremely important. Okay, so the one thing that uh, we are often gonna have to do is try to assess what a size the bacterial population actually is. And um, there are a number of ways in which this can be done. Um, these are the ones that we will uh, discuss. Plate counts, filtration. This here, this most probable number method, I'm only going to mention, and you can read, please, and you are pleased to read through this, the slides and that section in your text on your own. And then I'll discuss a bit about direct microscopic counts and also spectral photometry. Okay, so um, this uh, is something that you will do in lab if you have not already done it. Um, a very common way to establish how large a bacterial population is, is to do what we call a plate count. And in a plate count, we are going to actually take a plate we're going to spread a sample of bacteria and we're going to spread that sample wide enough that the bacteria are separated from one another and leave it to grow and where each bacterium was there will be a colony and we can count those colonies and think back and say okay so originally this is the number of bacteria i spread 
So, well, that's fine. But don't forget that even a very, very small sample of bacteria contains, can contain billions. So I can take a, a sample of bacteria and I put it on a plate and I spread them far apart, as far apart as they could possibly be. If there's a gazillion bacteria on the plate, as far apart as they can possibly be, maybe right next door to one another. And they are going to form what we, I can never say it in American, L-A-W-N, a lawn is what I say. Bacteria spread onto a plate are too close to one another as the, the colonies grow, the colonies will grow into one another and they'll form a solid sheet, which we refer to as a lawn of bacteria. It's not gonna help you because you're not going to be able to count. So what you have to do is you have to make sure that when you do this technique, you put onto the plate, the original sample, very, very few bacteria. How are you going to do that? You're going to do it by performing a series of dilutions. You're going to take a sample and you're going to dilute it. You're going to take that dilution, you're going to dilute it again. You're going to take that solution, you're going to dilute it again, then dilute that again. Each time you're going to keep a careful record of what your dilution was. Ultimately, you're going to take a sample, you're going to put it onto the plate and count the number of colonies that grow. And then you can go back through your whole dilution series and you can say, if I have a sample which I diluted this many times and it produced this many colonies. In my very original sample, I must have had this many. We always rate per milliliter. Okay. So you are looking to be able to establish in your original sample, how many bacteria that I have. And you refer to your dilution series and the final number of colonies that you, that you end up with. There are two ways to do the plate. The first is, I have already referred to is briefly, the pour plate method. The second way of doing it is to actually spread on an already poured plate. You'll see, you'll see how this is done. Okay, so here, here is a typical dilution series. I've somewhere here, maybe in a flask or whatever, I've got an original number an original sample. And I want to know in this original, how many bacteria are there per milliliter? Maybe this is a sample of water that I took from a beach somewhere. And I want to know how many bacteria are present in that water that people are swimming in, all right? So what I'm gonna do is, I'm going to first of all realize if I take a, if I take a milliliter that and I spread it on a plate, there's going to be so many bacteria, I'm not going to be able to count them. So I'm going to have to do a dilution. So I take one milliliter of my original sample. Here it is here. I put it in here. And what I am going to do is I'm going to put one milliliter into nine milliliters of sterile water. So I have got then a one in 10 dilution. A one in 10 dilution. And I'm going to plate one milliliter of that. But here we go here. These are always expressed in scientific terminology, not written out. They're expressed in scientific terminology. A one in 10 dilution is a 10 to the minus one dilution. So now I'm going to spread one milliliter here and have a look and see what happens too many colonies. I cannot count. I can't count that at all. So by the way, you don't wait to do this. You do this whole series all at the same time and you do all of these plates at the same time. So in addition to my one in 10, I fortunately I take another, mix this up really well. I'm going to take another milliliter. I'm going to, and I'm now going to put it into another nine milliliters of water. Okay, so if I take a one in 10 here and I make a one in 10 again, that's one in 10 times one in 10, right? One 10 times one 10 is one in a hundred. 
So this is a one in a hundred dilution, that is 10 to the minus two. And you're gonna place it in milliliter. We'll have a look and you'll realize there's fewer, far fewer colonies there. In fact, there's a 10th of the number of colonies that there were there. This is a one in a hundred dilution there, still too many to count. So now I'm going to take, I'm gonna do the same thing again. I'm gonna take one in 10 of my one in a hundred. One 10 times 100 is one in a thousand. There it is there. This is a one in thousand dilution and I'm gonna place it. Well, now we're in business because this is, these are easily countable. One in a thousand is 10 to the minus three dilution. So um, if we count uh, here, I believe there are 54 colonies there. This is ideal because there is a standard to obey. And that is you only count plates where the number of colonies on the plates between 30 and 300. Even 300 is a little bit difficult to count, but it just takes time, that's all. But the standard is you only count between 30 and 300 plates that have between 30 and 300. This is ideal, it's got 54. This one here um, ha has far fewer colonies and it's less than 30. This one has only got three or four colonies. So these two are, are probably too, uh, too low. Um, this is another, another repetition, Ten, one tenth of one in a thousand, one in 10,000, 10 to the minus four, one in a hundred thousand, 10 to the minus five. So what we're going to do is now we're going to just, we're going to count the colonies here. And what you need to realize, what you, the concept you need to think of is what you've done is you've actually here, you've plated a very, very, very small subsample of your original. In fact, you have plated a very small volume that from your original that remains after you've done these dilutions. So you've plated just a very few bacteria, but now you need to relate these back to here. I, want to, I don't want to know how many there are here, I want to know how many there are in my original sample. And to work that out, what I do is I take this plate count number 54 and I divide it by the dilution. So in other words, I put 54 over 10 to the minus three, 54 over a thousand, and I divide that. How many, 1,000 into 54, how many, what is that division? Well, it's very easy because it turns out it's 54,000. Okay. It's, if, you, if I take this as the numerator, the plate count as the numerator, the dilution as the denominator, and I work it out, I don't even need a calculator. I can just look at it and say, okay, there's 54 in a one in 1,000 dilution. Then I had 54,000 cells per milliliter of my original back here. And that, by the way, needs to be written out in scientific notation. 5.4 times 10 to the three, sorry, times 10 to the four cells per milliliter. 5.4 times 10 to the four cells or bacteria per milliliter. And that is the way in which this dilution series is done. Let me just explain to you, though, how we do the actual spread. When we do a spread like this, we use a plate, an already poured plate like this. We use a pipette. We, in this case, we're taking one milliliter and we're putting it onto the plate. We then take, we then spread it. We actually spread it with a little tool. It looks like a hockey stick that we spread and we spread and we spread and we spread and we spread until the agar absorbs all the water. And until we can be sure that as far as possible, we've spread each bacterium in the sample as far as possible away from the others. It's not ideal, but as far as possible. 
So that is, that is the, called a spread plate. I just want to point one other thing out to you. In this case here, we've spread one milliliter. But very often what we'll do instead is spread a smaller portion, 0.1 milliliter. You need to realize that that is in itself a dilution. Okay, 1.1 milliliter is one tenth of a milliliter. So if I only spread 0.1 milliliter, I would need to take that into consideration here. If, for example, my one in a thousand, I'd spread 0.1 milliliter instead of one milliliter, this would be a 10 to the minus four dilution. Very, very important to realize that if you spread less, it needs to be accounted for in your dilution series. Okay, so here uh, is the alternative um, way of doing it. And um, that is to uh, do a pour plate. So in a pour plate, what we do is we have, uh, we, here's our sample. Here, this is our, our sample from the beach that we've diluted down and down and down and down and down. Now here we've got our 1000 dilution here tube here, and we pour out our one milliliter or our 0.1 milliliter, whatever you choose to do. And you then add melted agar here. Remembering our agar will stay liquid down to about 45 degrees Celsius. We pour it and we quickly swirl we mix these all up in there as quickly as possible. We swirl it around and around and around, and that, that will separate bacteria out one from the other. They will then grow in that agar, in and on that agar. Um, so this is just an alternative way of doing it. This is a pour plate. And um, notice something important, and that is it doesn't matter how much agar you pour it. It's not gonna make any difference. What is important is the size of the sample here. Here's the spread plate method. Um, this is what I meant by a hockey stick there. Yeah. It's just a bent um, uh, glass rod thing like that or plastic that we use to spread the sample out. Okay, um, so uh, the next method of of counting that I'm going to discuss is called filtration counting. And uh, this is very easy. Um, this is a common way of looking at aquatic bacteria, um, especially looking for fecal bacteria like E. coli, et cetera, coliform bacteria. That's the term you'll hear in water, uh, for example, at beaches or wherever. And um, again, Usually you'll do a dilution series to make sure that you don't have too many bacteria and keeping a careful record of your dilution series. You then pass the sample through a filter. And the filter is small enough that it will trap all the bacteria. Here, you can see it here. This, these holes, these round things here are the holes in the, in the filter in the back there. And these are the are bacteria themselves trapped on a filter. Um, you then take this whole filter, you take the whole filter and you put it onto a solid egg or medium. If you look here, this, uh, look in, so that you can just make out the filter itself there. There's the filter surface that was exposed to the water that actually did the filtering. And what's happened is it's filtered out bacteria and where each bacterium was filtered, it grows a colony. And you can, this is, pro, this is probably something like McConkie's agar that we, we saw before, which is selected uh, for uh, gram negatives. And it's selected, it's strongly selected for gut bacteria, for fecal coliforms. So um, where each one grows, you see a distinct colony and you count them. You know your dilution series, you know how many colonies you've got, you can work out the population of the original. So this is, I'm only going to mention, uh, this is most probable, the most probable number method. Um, the, and uh, this uses, uh, again, a kind of dilution series, and it uses a mathematical formula to work out how many bacteria uh, you had originally. And um, so uh, just know that it exists. 
I, I'm not expecting you to remember how it is, is done, but please read through these slides. But we must have a look at a, a way of, uh, that is quite frequently used, of looking directly and doing a direct count, looking at an actual sample of bacteria through the microscope and counting the number of cells that we see. So the, this has to be done under very careful conditions, um, as, I, as I show you. The first thing is we need to be uh, get a good statistically valid count of the number of cells. Um, and in order to do so, we actually do a number of counts to try and ar arrive at an accurate number. So we have a number of cells counted. And we need then to relate that to a particular volume. And this is the, the difficulty. If I just take a sample, I put it onto a microscope and I drop a cover slip onto the top. I have no idea what volume I'm actually counting underneath, right? If I look through the, I see the microscope field. I have no idea what the volume in that that microscope field encompasses, unless I do it under very carefully controlled conditions. And this is how it is done. This is a, a counting chamber. This is actually a microscope slide, a special microscope slide. It's thick so that there's no bending. There's no variation in, in the slide at all. On this, this, this ridge here, and this ridge here are slightly raised above this ridge here. So I can take a sample of bacteria, my original sample, let's say my beach water, okay. And I'm gonna drop it on here, on this here, and I'm gonna put on top of it, this cover slip here. It's a special cover slip. It's, it's also a thick cover slip so that it does not bend. And you'll see the relevance of that when you realize that underneath here, the distance between the cover slip and the bottom of the slide here is a constant because they are both rigid. And this is very, very carefully manufactured. So that there is a constant distance between cover slip and the slide. So there's a constant depth of water, of medium that you are looking through. Then, scored onto this uh, ridge here in the middle, there is a grid, which obviously has a constant area. So we've got constant area times a constant depth. So when I'm looking at this here, I can work out exactly what the volume is that I'm looking at. Now, all I have to do is count the number of cells in that volume, right? So now there's lots of these squares, by the way, and I can count many, many, many of them and get an average count. There are some rules you need to obey. Usually, for example, if uh, as this one, you need to decide for yourself if, uh, a back, if a cell crosses a line here between there and there, do I count it here or do I count it here? I can't count it both there and there, okay? So you usually decide, okay, any cr if it crosses a line, you count below, not above. If it crosses to the left, you count to the right, etc. You just set yourself those rules so that you double, don't double count cells which are across a line. You count the number of cells within these squares, repeat it a number of times and you get the number of cells per volume and you can work it out per milliliter. Direct count, you're looking directly, but it's also a very direct way of doing it. There, there is a problem though. And the problem is that um, uh, cells are very often highly motile. So this is a huge difficulty. If you're going to count uh, bacteria which are motile, you actually have to fix them. You have to kill them in order to count them. You need to be very careful when you do that, that you don't end up bursting up all the cells and getting a low count uh, of cells. Um, but this is a very easy, very 
quick way of doing it. Uh, if you want to know the actual, I, I didn't make a, a fuss about it, but if you want to know the actual volumes, here they are here. It's a standard for, the, for this particular uh, slide manufacturer, Petrov House, it's the most commonly used. Um, these are the actual volumes that are concerned. Okay, so that's direct method, very, a very easy method once you get used to, to doing it. Here is another method, and probably this is much more common. This is especially widely used for very well-known bacteria, such as E. coli, which are widely used in the, the laboratory. And this is to actually take uh, either um, a nutrient medium, into, which has been inoculated, or a dilution, and to see how much light is actually absorbed by that. So the first thing to do, this first thing to point out, this is done in a special machine called a spectrophotometer. And a spectrophotometer measures the strength of light, wavelengths of light. So what do we do? We have a light source, we have a light sensor, and we introduce between them um, our tube and we see how much light is actually absorbed by the tube. We zero the machine with a blank. So if this was, if we were doing real count, we would zero with medium that had not, that was absolutely sterile. And um, we would set our machine to zero. As this means the light is passing unimpeded by bacteria through. If they may, it may be absorbing some light, but we, we could control for that okay, by zeroing the machine. This is what we're saying to ourselves. There is zero absorption by bacteria. So that if I now introduce a tube which is turbid with bacterial growth, the absorbance of light is by the bacterial cells. The more a light um, absorbed and the more light scattered by the bacteria inside this tube, the less light will reach the light sensor. And I can measure that loss. I can measure the absorbance um, of this. This is done usually at particular wavelengths of light, which would be set in, in the experimental protocol. So that is the basic principle. We are measuring how much light is absorbed or scattered by our bacterial suspension, by the actual physical presence of those cells. So that is fine. What does it mean? If I get a reading of absorbance here, how on earth do I relate that to the actual concentration per milliliter of bacterial cells? I have to do some preparation before I run this experiment in order to understand, in order to be able to translate it into an actual figure, number of cells per milliliter. I have to do some preparatory work. And in order to do so, what I've got to do is I've got to produce a standard curve. And that is, I need to produce a standard curve which relates the absorbance, which is what we're relating, which what we're measuring here. I need to be able to relate this absorbance to an actual cell count, to the number of cells per milliliter of bacteria. And um, the way in which I do that is I have to do a preliminary experiment. And I, I must use some other counting method, right? I can use spread plate, for example, um, or I could use direct counting. And I need to relate that to actual known dilutions and absorbance. So I need to run a series of experiments, first of all, where I take tubes with different known populations of bacteria. And I need to measure the absorbance at each of those known populations. This is all preparatory work. Okay? What I end up with is a standard curve like this. Once I've got that, I, well, I, I just have to do this once for this bacterium under those conditions. 
once I've got that curve, I can do my experiment here and I can say, okay, if I have a, an absorbance, I, th I can't quite see it. I think it's 0.7 there, right? If I've got an absorbance of that, then what I, if what I need to do is I need to come here, look for the absorbance there and relate it to an actual bacterial count per milliliter. And this here is giving me bacteria per mil. So for that absorbance, I've got about 14 times 10 to the six, 1.4 times 10 to the seven bacteria per milliliter. So once I've done this preparatory work, once I've prepared my standard curve like this, then it's easy. Then I can just do any number of these experiments and measure the absorbance. Every time I do the absorbance, I can just look it up on my standard curve. In actual fact, this has been done so many times that you can actually look up these standard curves for well-known bacteria grown under particular circumstances. Okay, so you can look up for E. coli grown at this with this recipe of liquid medium at this temperature for this length of time. This is these are the this is the standard curve. Okay, so and that is it. I do need to just tell you, uh, remind you all, please, that um, on Wednesday uh, you have your second test. And um, I also need to tell you that on Tuesday uh, evening, at Tuesday afternoon rather, at four o'clock, Tuesday afternoon, four o'clock, I will set up a Zoom meeting to answer questions. This, I do not call this a review session because a review session, everybody comes and stares at me and expects me to go through everything that I've taught for weeks and suppress it all into however long and tell you exactly what's going to be on the quiz, right? On the test, rather. No, you need to come to the session to, on Tuesday, four o'clock, with specific questions, with specific questions in mind, and I will attempt to answer. If there are no questions, then I'll assume that you're all fine, and we'll end the session early. All right. So I will send out that Zoom link to all of you. Uh, to meet you tomorrow if you do have questions. Okay, and we'll leave it there for today.